Welcome to the Antioch Podcast, designed to nurture knowledge, cultivate creativity, heal the heart, and strengthen for service. Thanks for listening, and welcome home. All right, guys, we got to dive in. Luke 3. Here we go. Yes, God is doing something this morning. I'm so excited. Um, Luke 3. Are we ready? Yes. Say amen. Uh, Luke 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word, the, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And we're going to pause right there today. Um, so a couple things going on, and I don't want you to miss it because it's actually fascinating what Luke is doing here. Luke is introducing John the Baptist in a very specific way. In, in laying out who's leading here and who's, who's the Caesar and who's the temple priest and all of that stuff, what he's doing is he's introducing John in the exact same way that the Old Testament prophets are introduced. So he's making a very clear statement that any of the Jews who would read this would understand immediately. He's introducing a prophet. This is a proclamation. This is a prophet of God that is now here. John the Baptist is a prophet in the line and in the tradition of Isaiah and Elijah. And his proclamation, his first proclamation, at least what Luke has us focus on, is this idea of preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That line just caught me this week as I was studying preaching a baptism of repentance. That means to immerse yourself in repentance, to throw yourself into and be soaked by repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And immediately inside of me, I was like, wait, 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 repentance doesn't bring us the forgiveness of sins. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. So what is happening here? Repentance is how we open the door to let the forgiveness come in. Repentance is the way that we open ourselves up to be able to receive the forgiveness that the Messiah would bring, that Christ would bring. So it begins with repentance. This is how we prepare the way, which is the very next verse as we go. Verse four, as is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways made smooth. And all the people will see God's salvation. First, can I just point out the fact, like just read that a little bit carefully. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. I suggest to you that is repentance. It's what it's all about. Repentance is how we prepare the way in the wilderness, how we prepare ourselves and get ready. He says, make straight the path for him. He doesn't say he's going to make the path straight. We make the path straight. We prepare the way. We fill in the valley. We bring the mountains low. We, We do all we can to prepare our hearts for the coming of the king, to prepare our hearts for the kingdom of God. And there's an incredibly important thing that's happening here, and in, in, it's this simple statement. The wilderness is where this happens. He's the voice of one caught. Not just he happens to be in the wilderness saying these things. I think maybe we'd be better by putting the comma after the word calling, the voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. In the wilderness, make straight paths for him. In the wilderness, fill in the valleys. In the wilderness, bring every mountain and hill low. 
In the wilderness, let the crooked roads become straight. The rough way is made smooth. The wilderness is an essential place for the people of God. It's where John the Baptist went. It's where Jesus was led. And we're, we're going to read about that soon. He was led into the wilderness to be tempted and then be filled with the Spirit of God and to begin his ministry. It was in the wilderness that Paul went after he came to Christ and, and, and God had to straighten out a bunch of stuff. So he had to go into the wilderness and prepare the way for the Lord to come and change his life and transform his life and prepare him and, and create him into this new thing. It's in the wilderness that we prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord. We prepare ourselves for the kingdom of God. Um, this is where we need to come to repentance, is in the wilderness. When you find yourselves in the wilderness, so many people are so quick to try to get out of the wilderness. That's where God wants to do some work. When you're going through hard times, when it feels like it's really dry, it's, it's, it's so you can start doing some work. It's hard to do gardening if it's raining out. It's okay if it's dry. It's a good time to get stuff ready. It's a good time to sow the seed so that when the rains do come, it, it, it will produce incredible fruit. In the wilderness is where we prepare for the Lord. Don't be afraid of the wilderness seasons for the dark night of the soul, for the difficult times that come. We're going to go through difficult times. But what we do in those times, what we do in the wilderness, has a huge impact of what happens when we come out of that wilderness. Jesus was ready. Jesus used that wilderness season, and he came out filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. How you act and what you do in the wilderness matters desperately, and the wilderness is the place for repentance. <sighs> Hosea 2, verses 14 through 16. We're not going to put it up. I just want you to listen to this. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. This is God speaking. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards, and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. You guys, it's in the wilderness that our relationship with God becomes real. Where he becomes not just the Savior, but my Savior. He becomes not just the Lord, but my Lord. There's an intimacy to be found in the wilderness. And, and some of you I know are in wilderness seasons right now. Prepare the way for the Lord. Some of you are not in a wilderness season right now. Praise the Lord. Enjoy the place where you're at. But don't worry. We, we get so worried sometimes when things are going well, like, oh, when is the, when is the problem going to come? Things have been going too well lately. I know something bad is going to... You guys, even if something happens, even if you find yourself in the wilderness, it's just another place for you to really meet with God and for your relationship to go deeper and deeper and deeper with him. Don't be afraid. But in the wilderness, look to repentance. Our repentance will always lead to the Holy Spirit coming in and changing everything. Verse seven, let's keep going. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. There's that repentance idea again. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, just really quickly, let me highlight something here. It's right, it is good that they were coming to the wilderness to meet with John the Baptist. They were coming there to be baptized. They all understood what this meant. It was, it was a ritual cleansing 
in order for someone to be able to go into the temple in order to offer up a sacrifice, they had to be baptized in the mikvahs. If you go to Israel, right outside of where the, the temple walls would be, there are these ritualistic mikvahs, these, these baths. And you would go into the bath and you would ceremonially cleanse yourself so that in that cleansing, you could then go and you can bring your offering to the Lord. Now, John is just challenging him. He's like, why are you coming to be baptized? There's no point in just going into a mikvah and then going back home. You go into the mikvah so that you could bring an offering, so that you could bring a sacrifice. Otherwise, you're just dirtying the water. Why are you coming here? Are you sincere about your repentance? I think is what he's asking them. Are you, are you really here to repent? Do you really intend to change, or the way he says it, do you really intend to produce fruit in keeping with repentance? That's the question. He's like, you're coming out here, which is great. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you want to be baptized. Do you have any intention of actually producing fruit of this repentance? Or are you just saying words? In the same way that they would rely on Abraham as their father, I think sometimes in the church, we're like, well, you know, I have Jesus, which is true, and it's amazing, but are, are you really connected to him? Or are you just saying his name? There's this, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. I, don't have time. I gotta stay focused. Seven sons of Sceva, that's all I'm gonna say. Like, like do, you, do you really know him? And that's the key. Are you coming to be baptized? Are you, are you intending to produce fruit in keeping with repentance? Which, what does it look like? What, is, what does that even mean? What does it look like to produce fruit in keeping with repentance? I'm so glad you asked. It's what they asked too, verse 10. What should we do then? Just pause and, and, and think about this. Put yourself in their position. They've come knowing, I need to do something. John the Baptist, he's out there. And he, he's, he's doing baptisms. I'm, I'm going to go out into the wilderness and I'm going to find him. And I'm going to be baptized by him. And he's like, wait, hold on, before you do. Why are you here? Are you just here to get wet? Are you just here to make yourself feel good? Like, okay, I did my religious duty and I could check off the list and now I could go back to living my life the way I want to live? Or are you really here to change? Are you really here to give everything and, and to be transformed? And they ask, well, what should we do then? We, we came to you because that's what we thought we do. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share the one uh, who has share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, "What should we do?" Don't collect any more than you're required to. He told them. Then some soldiers asked him, "And what should we do?" He replied, "Don't extort more money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay." It's three different people there. There's the crowd, there's the tax collectors, and there's the soldiers. People in different places of life. People in different expressions of their faith, so to speak. Three different types of Jewish people. And he addresses them differently. They're different trees. In different trees, the fruit of repentance looks different on different trees. For the tax collectors and the soldiers... Basically, his response is, it isn't what you need to do, it's what you need to stop doing. Um, to be clear, just so you know, he's not talking to Roman soldiers here. Roman soldiers wouldn't have come out for baptism to John the Baptist. These are Jewish soldiers. These are uh, uh, Jewish people who have been hired by Rome to oversee the citizens, to oversee their brothers and their sisters, 
And the tax collectors, also Jewish people that are getting paid by the Romans to take up the money and to to collect the taxes from their brothers and sisters. And both the soldiers and the tax collectors famously were hated, not because they did their job. I think it's really telling that John the Baptist doesn't tell him stop being a tax collector, stop being a soldier. He didn't have a problem with that. The problem he had is you were using your position of authority and power to take advantage of your brothers and sisters. Stop it. His response to them is, is basically, stop sinning. Just stop. You know what you ought to do. That's not the problem. The problem is that you keep doing the things you ought not to do. The fruit of repentance is just to stop sinning. That's, the, that's where you start. Um, for the crowd, he takes it one step further. For the crowd, he says, be generous. Share with your brothers and sisters. In short, love your brother and sister. The second greatest command. Be intentional about it. Be, be patient with your brothers and sisters. Be kind. Share a shirt with them. Give them some food if they need food and you have extra. Because love is patient and love is kind. He's just telling them to... to Be patient and kind. He's not telling them to make some extravagant sacrifice. And I'd say the same for you. It's What do I have to do to produce fruit in keeping with repentance? It's nothing extravagant. It's nothing extravagant. The extravagant sacrifice has already been made. And you're not the one that has to do it. Yours is simple. Be generous. Church, can be generous be kind to one another if we could get that right just those two things I, actually if we could start with stop sinning that would be fantastic too and to be generous and kind you couldn't stop the church from growing it would take over the world immediately, like a wildfire. I know sometimes we're like, oh, I need to start a ministry and we need to do some amazing, you don't need to do amazing things. Be generous and kind. It will transform this world immediately. Devastatingly transform this world. I was thinking about the fruit this morning as I was preparing. I was thinking about different fruits. So this, you know, it's Riverside. Oranges. You guys are used to that, right? Yeah. That's an orange. That's a, that's a fruit right there. <laughs> Sometimes they look like that. I happen to have a tree where it looks like this. <laughs> and then sometimes there's this. In all fairness, this isn't an orange, but then again, those aren't either. And we read stuff like this, and we we see that the, the fruit is different depending on the maturity, depending on the tree, depending on what's going on. And and we hear the story of the like the the tax collector. And we're like, okay, he's just telling them to stop ripping people off. Well, that doesn't seem like much of an offering. Let's see, you know, that seems something like this. And then like for the others, it's, you know, just be content with your pay. Don't extort money. Okay, well, maybe that's a little bit of a, I don't know, maybe something like that. And like the be generous. Oh, that's, I can be generous to people. That's, I work hard for my money and I, I didn't. The homeless people, they, you know, they're there because they deserve it or because they're not working hard. Why should I have to give what I've gathered to, to, to support all of that and to help out and to help out rebirth homes and be generous and stuff like that? Oh, gosh, that's such a huge sacrifice. Honestly, I think it's the other way around. I think for the tax collector, and I could tell you someone who didn't believe, those first steps the producing the fruit of repentance of the simple things like 
I'm not going to go out and get drunk this weekend. Now, to be clear, the, the fruit of repentance, that doesn't save you. It opens the door for salvation to come in. But it's a real offering. It's a real sacrifice. And at the beginnings, it's this. The sinner who comes and just recognizes their sin is a greater sacrifice than the righteous who come and, and, and give their whole lives. The difficulty when you're beginning of the, just those first steps of faith, it's huge fruit and it's heavy and it's difficult. But you know what's amazing? This is the generosity. This is the kindness. And I will tell you, of all of these, this is the sweetest of them. This tiny little, this isn't an immature, this is a fully mature fruit from my tree. And at the beginning, when you're first starting, I, it's like grapefruit. I don't like grapefruit. It's sour. I don't, it's not, just not enjoyable. I don't like it. Corey likes it a lot, but that's probably why she loves me. But uh, so it's like this, 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 that's, but this is so sweet. It's like candy. I think generosity, it's, it's a giving of everything that you have. It's like my whole life is yours, God. You know what's amazing about this is this fruit, you eat the whole thing. Yeah. Skin, the skin is sweet. It's like candy. We'll come back and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Let's keep going. Verse 18, or verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. I know we tend to read this as like, oh, he's super harsh with it. This is the good news. It's the baptism with the Holy Spirit in fire. And what does that look like? John baptized with water. He could only rinse them off. But Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit, which becomes a river of life flowing from within. John's water baptism was a ceremonial cleansing so that you could make an offering to the Lord. It was a mikvah. Jesus' fire baptism makes us the temple and makes us the offering to the Lord. It's not just so we could bring an offering. Now we are the offering. Yes. His baptism of fire is that you could give him all of you. It doesn't have to just be a part. You don't have to just bring something in. You're now the temple. You're now the sacrifice. Verse 19, but when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other things he had done, Herod added to this to them all. He locked John up in prison. In short, he did not respond. He did not repent when the wilderness came. And now we transition to Jesus. Verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. In the very next verse, Jesus begins his ministry. I just want to highlight that. Jesus has not yet started his ministry. And God's proclamation, the Father's proclamation over him. My son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Do you believe, do you understand that God's love and his pleasure has nothing to do with what Jesus accomplished or with what we accomplish. 
He didn't even start his ministry yet. Just let that sink in because it's important that you understand. It was Jesus' humility and immersion into the Trinity, his baptism into the Trinity, that moves the heart of the Father. It wasn't what he did. It wasn't like, wow, I'm so proud of this ministry you've started. Look at how many people you've reached. It was before he did anything. I am well pleased with you. Let's keep going. Verse 23. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Methot, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Matthias, the son of Semyon, the son of Joseph, the son of Jodah, the son of Joannan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of El Madam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Methot, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of jo- Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Meleah, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. The son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hesron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Aphraxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. I just want to point out this from all of that, because I have no time. The genealogy begins, Jesus' genealogy begins with, he was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. He begins with that, but then he finishes the genealogy with the true lineage of Jesus, the son of God. So, I'm just going to finish with this, and then we're going to take communion together, which will be the most exciting part of the entire service. We're talking about living hope and living from hope, and what does that look like? And he's just a few takeaways that I have from what we've talked about today. Number one, repentance opens the door to forgiveness. Repentance opens the door to forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't something that's just going to happen to you. You saying a prayer isn't going to do the trick. You coming to church every single way, every single week, that's not going to do it. I don't care how much money you put into the offering. I don't care how much you serve. And the, the saying goes, being in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a Cadillac. Repentance is what opens the door to forgiveness. It opens the door to forgiveness. It doesn't create the forgiveness. God doesn't forgive you because you repent. It opens the door. And here's, I'm going to just wreck with some of your theologies. You do not have to ask Jesus to forgive you because he already has. You don't have to ask him for forgiveness. He has already provided for it on the cross. If Jesus had to forgive you every time you sinned, he'd have to climb back on that cross and be crucified all over again. It's like, oh, you messed up. All right, hold on. Let me climb up this cross one more time. It's done. It's complete. It is finished. Tetelestai. All of the forgiveness is there for you. It's ready and it's waiting for you. You need to receive it. How do you receive it? Repentance. 
opens the door and invites the forgiveness to come in. It has to start there. I'm sorry, I wish there was another way. There's not another way. It has to be real repentance, the kind that like is producing fruit in keeping with the repentance. You can't produce the fruit of the spirit, but you can produce the fruit of repentance. And I'll just say it as simply as I can. Stop sinning, be generous, and be kind. That's it. That's a, it's very simple steps, guys. That's what it is to produce the fruit of repentance. To be clear, you not sinning anymore is not going to save you. You being generous and kind, not going to save you. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about repentance. The forgiveness is already taken care of. But if you want to be able to receive it, you got to start here. Stop comparing. This is important and hear me, church. Please, as the church, can we please stop comparing our fruit with others? Your fruit of repentance may look extremely different than someone else's fruit of repentance. It doesn't mean that they're not both incredibly valuable to God. Your maturity changes what your fruit looks like. The type of tree that you were created to be changes what your fruit looks like. All of these are precious to God. And so often we find ourselves either we're like this and we look at that and we're like, oh gosh, look at that, I'm, I'm horrible. And I'm, I'm not, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. Because look at that guy's fruit of repentance. Or worse, we're like, those guys, do they, they don't even, do they even love Jesus? If you really love Jesus, you wouldn't be like that. Let your fruit be your fruit. You give to the Lord what grows on your tree of repentance. And, and surprisingly, sometimes the smallest ones are the sweetest to the taste. And our del- the Father delights in them. And speaking of producing fruit in keeping with repentance, be baptized. That's, that's what baptism is all about. With water, with fire, with the Holy Spirit, with all of it. In baptism, we share in Jesus' death and we choose to give our life to him. And it is our humility in bending our knee and being willing to be baptized and give him our everything that changes our relationship with him. That's what makes him smile. If you want to move God's heart, humble yourself. Give him your everything. He doesn't need you to create some amazing ministry that's transforming this world. He needs you to just give him your heart. That's what he wants more than anything else. I mean, then he's going to use you to do incredible things or not or not. I am loose change in God's pocket. He could spend me as he pleases. He just wants you to give him your everything because he already gave you his everything. Which leads me to this opportunity. If any of you have not been baptized and you want to be baptized, we're going to do a baptism on Easter morning. So if you are interested in... It's the wrong word. If it is time for you to be baptized, if that is the, the fruit that you are preparing to offer to the Lord, um, and pray about it. Be obedient if he's called you. If you consider yourself a follower, let this Easter morning be the day that you lay your fruit, that you lay your life at his feet and give him your everything. Um, if you would like to do that, please come and talk to me. I would love to hear about that. And we'll meet up a little bit and, and talk a little bit about the process. And while we're called to prepare the way, we remember that our Lord prepared the way for us in Christ. So we come now with open hands, open hearts, and open mouths to receive not to produce, 
you can't produce this. Oh, by the way, if you have your Bibles, open to Luke 3 still. I want you to go back and see something. Verse 6. Leading up to verse 6, he says, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill be made low. The crooked ways shall become straight, the rough ways smooth. That's our repentance. And the very next verse, And all people will see God's salvation. Um, Verse 6 isn't a quote from Isaiah. He was quoting Isaiah. And then all of a sudden Luke enters his own thought into the scripture here. And he makes this incredible proclamation. And all people will see God's salvation. We can't do it. But he can. Augustine famously said, without you, oh no, let me say it right. Without him, we can't. But without us, he won't. So we begin with our repentance. We prepare the way for the Lord. But we remember all along, he has already prepared a way for us through the cross, through his body broken and his blood poured out. And so now in this final time of our being together, we're going to come together and meet at the Lord's table. This isn't about producing. This is about receiving. And if you need to repent right now, don't come to the Lord's table unworthily. Repent. Give him your everything. Just let it all go. And when you're ready, come and receive. Um, the way we do this, in case you're joining us for the first time today, um, we will come up and there's uh, wine and juice back there by the mirror and also in the back by the painting of the bride. Um, we invite you to come and receive the elements of the bread and go back and get the juice or wine, whichever you prefer. Um, and then hold on to the elements and we will all take them together as soon as everyone has them. So at this point, let me just pray over the bread. Lord, we thank you that you made a way. That you prepared a way for us. And that any love we pour out is because you first loved us. So Lord, I thank you for being broken, for the forgiveness of our sins. And Lord, we repent to receive that forgiveness. God, you are so good. We thank you for the bread, and we thank you for the wine, and we come now to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. To continue the journey, you can find us online at IamAntioch.com or join us next Sunday.